I have to tell you a story about Vince. In 1950, I spent six months as a resident methodologist at the U.S. Bureau of the Census. And as a result of that, I was appointed to the American Statistical Association Advisory Committee to the Census. And we were consulted on the appointments of directors. And shortly after I became a member of that committee, the director had finished his term since it's a presidential appointment. And the new one nom nominated for the job was Vince Barraba. And I hold the distinction, I was the only member of the advisory committee that voted against his appointment. <laughs> he is the only man in history who ever held that job for two consecutive presidents of different parties. The outstanding director of the U.S. Bureau of the Census. So that's probably the worst error I ever made, Vince. And he's been trying to get even with me ever since. <laughs> The nice thing about being at a university is that occasionally you get a truth here, particularly about yourself. Uh, I was walking down the hall in Steinberg Dietrich building, which is the main old building of the Wharton School, recently after giving a lecture to one of the classes. The student stopped me in the hall and he said, Professor, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? I said, no, go ahead. He said, how old are you? I said, 85. Wow, he said. <laughs> when did you start teaching? I said, September of 1941 at this university. Wow, he said. <laughs> You've been teaching 60 years more? Yeah. He said, what's the last time you taught a course in a subject which existed when you were a student? <laughs> well, that was a wonderful question. I had to reflect on it, and after a while I said, September of 1951. Wow, he said. You mean to say you've been teaching stuff that you never had as a student for more than 50 years? I said, yeah. He said, you must be a pretty good learner. I modestly agreed. <laughs> he said, what a shame you're not that good a teacher. <laughs> you learn a lot about yourself, and that's when I learned that the function of the faculty member is not to teach, but to facilitate the learning of others. So I'm not going to try to lecture to you or teach you today, but I hope to do is motivate you to do something you might not otherwise have done. The subject of the confirmation is transformation, and it will focus on the transformation of organizations and institutions. I want to focus on the big one, the globe, because the global system, if you can call it a system, is in a hell of a mess. That doesn't have to be documented. I don't have to quote anybody. If there's anybody that's not aware of the mess that the world is in, then they ought to be here. And it's not very hopeful. It's very pessimistic. Not too long ago, Mr. Gelb, in an article in the New York Times, has a wonderful reflection on the state of the world. Let me read it to you. The emerging world requires a new foreign policy agenda and fresh faces to execute that agenda. The trouble is, the same old experts are still running foreign policy, and most of them only dimly understand the world they preside over. Indeed, few people today, in or out of government, have the background and skills to grasp, let alone direct the new agenda. See, that doesn't give us a lot of hope. I think we have something to contribute that could at least have some effect on the decline of the West. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about transformation in contrast to reformation. You see, to reform a system is to leave the system as it is, but change its behavior. It's a modification of the means which it employs. But to transform a system is to change its objectives or its ends. Now, that distinction is fundamental, but not well understood. And like many things he's done, Peter Drucker put it better than anybody I know when he said there's a difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. See, reform is about doing things right. Transformation is about doing the right thing. As my students are familiar with my observation that the righter you do the wrong thing, the wronger you become. If you make a mistake doing the wrong thing and correct it, you become wronger. 
So it's better to make a mistake doing the right thing than do the wrong thing right. But our problem at the global level is our continuous effort to improve our doing the wrong thing. One contribution to that incorrectness is our failure to distinguish between the objectives we proclaim and the ones we practice. You see, to say that transformation is a change of objectives, I don't mean the change of the proclaimed objectives, I mean it's change in the ones that are actually followed. Uh, George Feeney, who was one of the more distinguished operations researchers, was given an assignment by Fred Borch, the CEO of General Electric, a number of years ago uh, to evaluate the corporate objectives. Uh, George took a list of the published objectives to GE, there were 10 of them, the usual ones. You know, maximize shareholder value, be a good corporate citizen, provide the employees with challenging and rewarding, all, all the motherhood statements you're used to. He took the decisions made by the corporation over the last five years and compared them against the objectives. And he found that every single decision violated at least one of the corporate objectives. So he said, now there's only two possible explanations. The one is that these are not the objectives, and the other is that they're stupid. Now he said, I know GE's management, they're not stupid, so these are not the corporate objectives. How do I find out what they are? Well, he did an ingenious thing. He took the objectives as a starting point and said, what objectives would maximize the value of the decisions that were made? What, would, what objectives would optimize those decisions, working backwards? He found one that accounted for 92% of the decisions made. It's to maximize the wealth, security, and quality of life of the people who made the decisions. That's what corporations are about. Now, the reason I'm sure of that is I've presented that finding to thousands of executives around the world, and I've never had one deny it. They unconsciously, if not consciously, admit it. The proclaimed objective to maximize shareholder value is a nonsense. To maximize profit is a nonsense. Peter Drucker, again, is the one who pointed out, he said, profit is to a corporation what oxygen is to a person. Necessary for its existence, not the reason for it. Profit is a requirement, not an objective. If you don't meet the requirement, you won't be there to satisfy your own needs. Maximizing shareholder value is clearly a myth. You just look at the corporate aircrafts, the country club memberships, and the rest of it, and you know damn well that that's not what the corporation is really about. And the same is true of education. If you think this or any other university is primarily dedicated to the education of students, you're naive. That's not what a university is about. It's about maximizing the quality of work life of the faculty. I attended faculty meetings for two years and was so bored I kept a record of the subject discussed here at this university. In the two years, the word student was only mentioned once. See, teaching is a price the faculty has to pay for the quality of work life at once. And like any price, it tries to minimize it. Now, it's easy to demonstrate that. List the faculty by rank, and then look at the amount of teaching they do. And what do you discover? The more power a faculty member has, the less teaching he does. You see, it's a cost he has to pay. The function of a university is only secondarily education. That's a requirement. It's not an objective of the university. This is a general characteristic of all organizations. Their proclaimed objectives differ from their true objectives. And if we're going to transform anything, we have to get to understand fundamentally what they're really pursuing rather than what they say they're pursuing. Now, transformation not only requires recognition of the difference between what's practice and what is preached, but it requires a different way of thinking than currently prevails. And Einstein put this better than anybody I know in the wonderful little quote, without changing our patterns of thought, we will not be able to solve the problems we created with our current pattern of thought. I have used that quote before thousands of executives, and I asked them, does anybody disagree with Einstein? And I've never had anybody disagree with them. And then I embarrassed them by asking, what does it mean? They have the foggiest idea what our current pattern of thought is, 
and why it's getting us into trouble. So it's very easy to agree with something you don't understand. <laughs>